Today we're taking a look at Aorus's add-in card. This is their MVME. They've got a 512 gigabyte flavor as well as a one terabyte flavor. Uh, right here on the desk, they sent over the one terabyte in for review. And there's some good points, there's some bad points. Though starting off with one of the coolest things is that if you've got an old PC like this Dell Vostro that I got here on the desk and it supports PCIe boot, then you can add in the MVME drive and get MVME speeds on your older PC. So things like X79 and even some of those Wannan boards coming off of AliExpress, I can imagine you could do some cool things with that. And considering the price is okay, it's at a decent price point. They've got the 512 gigabyte version starting out at 149 USD, in Australia 239 AUD, and then they've got the one terabyte coming in at 249 USD and then in Australia 399 AUD. So the one terabyte version, which is what we've got here, looks like it's better value in terms of per gigabyte per dollar. And also carries through with double the terabytes written rating where the one terabyte has 1600 terabytes written. And then the 512 gigabyte carries 800 terabytes written. They both carry a five year limited warranty and they're both rated at 1.8 million hours mean time before failure, which is absolutely huge. I think that's longer than most humans live. But with that aside, let's get straight into the test and see what is good and bad about this drive. Welcome back to Tech Yesterday, and right here we've got the Aorus RGB AIC NVMe SSD. So it's essentially a normal NVMe PCIe 3.0 X4 solution except they've added in 11 RGB LEDs, which is the first part I'm gonna critique about this piece of hardware, is that when I put it into my Z370 system and then loaded up the RGB Fusion 2.0 software, it didn't actually allow me to change the RGB colors at all. And on that note, it was actually changing the RAM color on a different brand of memory from Team Group. So I was a little bit surprised to see that happening. Uh, but the other additional software kit that they've got, the toolbox, that actually worked pretty well. It reads out your temperatures, supports things like trim, and shows you the status of your SSD. However, as I've critiqued in the past, some of Gigabyte's software, I'd like to see them overhaul this, integrate the two into one, so you could actually change the colors of your SSD's RGB lighting. That would be great. Now, speaking of the LED lights, they don't add really any heat to the drive itself. The whole power consumption is around about six watts on this SSD, even with those RGB LED lights on. But when I was stress testing this SSD, the temperatures were really good, coming in at 31 degrees Celsius on the surface and 33 degrees in the software. This is in a 24 degree ambient controlled environment. So the temperatures are really good. This is a 375 gram weighted heatsink, so it's absolutely huge. But looking underneath the hood in terms of the hardware they've put on this, they've got a FireSync controller I believe it is the P55012 E12, or otherwise known as the E12. They've got two SK Hynix 512 megabyte DDR3 burst banks to make a total of one gigabyte of DDR3 burst cache. Now, in terms of the actual NAND flash they're using in this is Toshiba 64 layer 3D TLC NAND. It says on the banks themselves, the model number is TA59655 AIV, and all that comes on a black PCB. I also will mention the build quality does feel very solid on this unit. There's no squeaky or loose parts, but what about the most important thing, and that is the speeds. Well, I decided to run three different tests, compare it against the Samsung Evo that I have here, the 970, as well as the Corsair MP510. Both are pretty value-oriented solutions out there on the market. Great for 4K video editors who need really fast speeds over the PCIe 3.0 spec. And what we saw here with the one gigabyte AS SSD test to test burst speeds was that we were getting very high read and write speeds, practically saturating the PCIe Gen 3 X4 slot. But moving down to the 4K read and writes, the random read and writes, they were a little bit underperforming on both the read and the writes. I tested this a few times and I'm not entirely sure what was going on there, but the QDEP test showed speeds that were very good, especially on the right side, and then the access times were mediocre. And this gave a total score of 6,246 points. Uh, moving over to the inputs and outputs, we had over 450,000 input outputs per second on the read side, and then on the right side, getting close to that of 700,000. Uh, changing things over, however, to the 10 gigabyte test, 
showed that read and write speeds were both sustainable on sequentials, 4K random read and writes were the same. However, the queue depth did drop down both on the read and writes, and then the access times were the same, and the input and outputs per second, the maximums were under 400,000, and then under that of 550,000 this time around. Though what about one of the most important tests that I run here with any storage solution, and that is the HG Tune Pro test. This is the 100 gigabyte torture test that I put practically every drive that comes through here through, and the speed showed that after about 25 gigabytes of sustained writes, the speeds dropped substantially from those scores that we saw in ASSSD down to around about 1100 megabytes per second. And then the read speeds did sort of remain consistent around 3000 megabytes per second. However, on two different tests, the read speeds did have some big dips. I'd say that have to be with maxing out the controller on board. So what we're seeing here is something that's similar to the other solutions on the market, like the Samsung and also the Corsair, in that they're pretty much using the same TLC NAND flash, maximizing what they can out of it. However, the burst speeds are great. However, it will drop down to just over that of a gigabyte per sec, which is still actually really good if you wanna use it for 4K video editing as a scratch drive, or use it over a 10 gigabit per second home or business networking solution. It will provide those speeds consistently. But now, of course, it's conclusion time with this SSD. What do I think of it? And I think for the money, it's decent. I mean, the one terabyte solution at 249 USD is pretty good, providing you can find it in stock. I could only find the 512 gigabyte solution available on the market on Amazon. And in Australia, I couldn't find these for sale just yet. I will update the description when I get some more news on that. But in terms of its performance, it's pretty much mediocre. I guess I'd put it pretty much in the middle of the field uh, at least in terms of what I've got here. I mean, Samsung are kind of leading that in terms of consistency and performance, uh, but they've decided to add in the RGB bling as well as provide a big heat sink to keep the temperatures down. And it does seem to work, but we have to go back to those consistencies on the read speeds in HD Tune Pro where they were dipping substantially from time to time. And then we also have to look at the software, which is still a little bit buggy. So if those two things don't bother you, and you do wanna get this and just whack it in and get pretty good speeds, then it is going to deliver on that front. But it's not the best SSD I've seen, but it's certainly not the worst I've seen either. And with that aside, I'll catch you guys in another tech video very soon. If you enjoyed this review, then be sure to hit that like button for us. And also if you're enjoying the content, you might wanna hit that sub button, ring the bell, and I'll catch you next time. Peace out for now, bye.